Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. All right. Welcome again to our midweek Bible study. It's near and far. We're glad you're with us studying a different book of the Bible. Uh, on our midweek Bible study, we're in the book of Genesis. Even before we started praying, but during the prayer, I had a confirmation of a scripture and just a thought that came to mind that I want to share with you. Uh, if you would, turn over to 2 Corinthians. I want you to see it in your Bible before we jump into the Word. 2 Corinthians. And I wonder how many of you uh, face this. Maybe you do. Maybe it'll be the Holy Spirit giving it to you for the future. But I know this hits me from time to time where, especially with social media, and I'm not on social media all that much, but the time that I'm on or depending on what my mood is or what my emotional makeup is, I can very easily allow social media to become a place where I compare myself. Anybody else do that? Just one, two. All right. We're going to have a special Bible study just for you over here in the corner and everyone else. I think it's direct or indirect. If you know, see it already, great, maybe in the future. But you begin to see, I mean, it could be something so dumb, right? You're eating leftovers from last week and somebody posts a picture of the best hamburger you've ever seen in your life. And you're like, man, I just wish I had that hamburger or anything else. You know, the enemy's very slick with this. It could be someone else's marriage. It could be someone else's house. It could be someone else's clothes. Now, already the, the world conditions us, you know, the marketing of the world, trying to convince you that you don't have something that you really should have, and everybody else has it, and the only thing separating you from having it is money, and I'm sure you can come up with it, and if you come up with it, you can be as happy as they are, and I was just, this verse came to mind, I just want to share it with you. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and beginning in verse 12, I'll read it to you from the New King James and also the NLT. I actually like the New King James better here, but uh, I'll read them both to you. Verse 12 says, he says, we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And what he says at the end in the NLT he says, but they are only comparing themselves with each other using themselves as the standard of measurement. And then he says in NLT, how ignorant. And I think you could also say how prideful. Because even as our measurements, even as we were praying today and God was taking us through Galatians, it is a reminder that there's a real comparison that God has given to us. There's a higher level of living that's available to us. And it's even better than what your friends have or what your enemies have or what the world's doing, or what they're into, it, it's even better. And it's just a foolish route to compare ourselves. We do it in our spiritual walks too. We think, oh, we should be so much farther because look at so-and-so. But the problem with that is that your comparison is not so-and-so. God is doing a work in you that's unique to you. And you're exactly where he wants you. You're exactly where he's going to use you. And the flip side of that, of course, is just praying for God to give you more contentment to have a settled contentment in what God's doing in your life. And I know this comes up in my life. It's always a constant temptation, and not even social media. It doesn't have to be uh, social media. It's just a constant uh, lack of contentment. And, and so maybe the Lord's speaking to you about that as he was speaking to me. So let's jump in uh, to the word, and we'll jump in right where we left off in Genesis 11. So Father, even if the topic is contentment for many tonight, we pray that you would give us, deposit that into our lives, that we would be satisfied in you. I know there's always a sense of, spirit, like a dissatisfaction spiritually that can be healthy where we can grow and want to grow in our walk with you, but there's also this unhealthy comparison, unwise, or as Paul said, ignorant, where we're just worried about other people's lives, other people's possessions, what you're doing in other people's lives. I think of that time uh, where Peter said, what about him? 
And you said, Jesus, what is that to you? You follow me. And so just solidify that for us as we come to you tonight, Lord, that you would say it all over to us, right? What is that to you? You follow me. And we come to follow you, God, in a very real way, opening ourselves to the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. I've entitled our Bible study, Self-Effort or Full Surrender. Self-Effort or Full Surrender. And in our study last time, we learned how God's heart is for all the nations, all people groups, all languages, the entire world. And it seems like something we would all agree with, but many within Christianity limit the world in so many different ways, not allowing it to be what it is. And there's so many limitations that we place upon people and the love of God that God is continuing to wrest that away from us so that we will agree with him. His heart from the very beginning was for the world. And we studied in depth uh, what's known as the Table of Nations. And that revealed some 70 families that repopulate the wor- earth after the worldwide flood. And all the nations and the people we learn have come from one source, one common ancestor, Noah, and his sons. And we learn that there is a unity of humanity. That's factual. There's a common link of brotherhood that binds the human race together. And so now let's look now what this perversion of unity can, can, what can happen with a twistedness and a twisted understanding of the unity in verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. At the time, mankind is culturally unified. Unified in language, most likely Hebrew, in thought, and in ideas. You could say that this was a picture here in chapter 11 of this one world mentality. This is a picture very early on in creation of a oneness. And today we have the advent of the United Nations and a great emphasis upon globalism. And many today believe that the whole goal of humanity is that the earth be unified. And that's exactly where we're headed. Now, of course, many today in government and those that are in leadership, those that might be billionaires and trillionaires, think that they're coming up with something new as if they invented it. But they're actually being used by the demonic forces to bring about what God has already predicted the last days will look like. And yet they speak about it like it's some new thing. You remember years ago they came together and they sang that song, We Are the World. But remember, when the world is defined, there's always people that benefit and there are those that suffer. The we are the world is never for the equal benefit of all. There are always, a, one of the scriptures in Revelation, I should have looked it up, but one of the scriptures that always fascinated me from the very first time I ever read Revelation as a new believer, that while all of this judgment is coming and while all this rebellion is happening, and and literally hailstones and fire and judgment is happening, there is a passage of Scripture in Revelation that speaks about the world rulers, or at least a few of the world rulers, are there with the wine and the oil. And what what is intended by that passage is to remind us that even in the midst of the worst of the worst judgment, there will still be those living in luxury as if nothing ever happened. And this is the days of Noah, and this is the days, these are the days that we are living in right now. And it's a popular theme. You'll hear phrases today like the Great Reset. You'll hear words like globalism. You have gathering annually at the World Economic Forum. This stuff is real. 
And it's happening right before our eyes. However, it is a perverted form of unity. And the word perverted in its original definition just means twisted. It is a perverted form of unity that is not the type of unity that's spoken of in the scriptures. So don't be confused because they use the same language. Biblical unity is found alone in Jesus Christ. The pathway to unity is the pathway of discipleship. And the pathway of discipleship was defined for us by Jesus. If anyone wants to follow after me, Jesus said, he must first deny himself. That is not the unity you see in the world today, and that's not the unity we see here in Genesis chapter 11. The motivation of building this tower was to become God and to be in the place of God. The the motivation of building the city and building the tower was against God, and it came in two different stages. Now, let me just say here, as we speak about cities and large populations, let me be very clear. God is not against cities. He isn't anti-city. He loves cities and especially loves the people that live in them. In fact, in the Bible, we are taught that there is a new Jerusalem, the city of God that will be here for all eternity. Cities, both large and small, and especially large cities, actually become a hub of ministry. It becomes the very central hub where from large cities, the spokes come out, from large populations, large resources, so that the gospel goes forward from cities. You'll you'll see as we study through the book of Acts that Paul would often, his methodology was to go into a big city and plant a church, and that church would grow and send out pastors and missionaries from the resources that were in the larger city. So he's not against cities but I can say that he is against rebellion and God is against pride and arrogance. And we find a great contrast in chapter 11, an important one. The Tower of Babel is built as men are gathering in cities, building great buildings and literally creating memorials for themselves. But then when we get to chapter 12, Notice with me, we're, we're going to spend a couple weeks in chapter 12, but for, for today, I want you to see the contrast between 11 and 12. While in Babel, or later Babylon with Nimrod, as he's gathering together, they want to build something for themselves, but notice the call to the father of faith in verse 1. God speaks directly to Abraham, to Abram at the time, and he has this relational communication with him, and what does he tell them? He wants, get out of your country from your kindred, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And God has something greater than cities. He says, I'm going to make you a great, do you notice it? Nation. God has a greater plan. You you might be stuck in this moment right now saying, this is for me, and this is what I want to build, and this is what I want to collect, and this is what I want to do, and we're going to do it for us. And you're so comfortable. And all the while, God has so much more for you. It's sort of like the understanding that sometimes our children have. They have a limited understanding when they're younger. They just don't grasp the kind of resources and availability of things that are available to them through obedience and surrender and relationship in their families. So so because of that, they live on very limited understanding. And, and, you know, they might be crying out for a piece of candy, piece of candy, got to have a piece of candy. And you're like, no, no, I don't want you to have candy tonight. And they're just like, I can't believe it. And they're throwing things at you and screaming at you. And all because of a little piece of candy. You said, no, no. And the reason why you held it back from them is that tonight was the night that you brought back a gallon of ice cream and you just had on your heart a desire to let your kids eat until they couldn't eat anymore. And here they are crying about a piece of candy And you have a whole gallon of ice cream that you were now, you were going to give it to them. But now because of their flipping out and they don't just trust you and they don't just say, hey, it's not good, don't take the piece of candy. Now they've worked themselves into a place of discipline and they're not getting the candy and you're eating the ice cream. But they don't understand. I wonder how often that's how you are with God. You're just fighting for what's ever in your hand, fighting what's ever in your hand and God says, no. No, I've already put it in writing for you. I have something that's exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask. Trust me. 
the contrast between chapter 11 and 12, I believe God wants us to see, is that realm of self-effort or full surrender. Is it just what you can bring up and what you can build and what you can do, or are you willing to answer the call of faith and say, I'm willing to come out. I don't know what's up ahead for me. What nation? What land? Oh, I'm going to show you. Just get up and go. You'll, you'll never experience it until you take the step of faith, and that'll be our time next time. But God has so much for you. He has so much more than you can even see today. And in one side, chapter 11, you've got a group trying to build for themselves. And you know what? The Lord will let you do that. You want to build for yourself? Have at it. Do you, do you want to get your best life now? Go ahead. But God has so much more for you. He has so much more than you could think or ask. He is ready to act on your behalf. With Abram, he doesn't want a name for himself. And you'll see that. Again, Abram, not a perfect man, a lot of mistakes. But you will see he is not interested in a name for himself. He is willing to walk by faith on every step along the way. A struggle today that in many of your lives that maybe comes and goes or is, is stagnant in your life is you are fighting right now between living for today or living for eternity. For some reason, you see them opposed to one another. And because living for today comes first, it makes it very hard to see anything eternally. It just makes it very hard to say, I don't know how I could ever get out of this. Yeah, but you're looking too, too close. You're blinded by the circumstance. You're just looking too close. God has victory for you. He, he has faith for you. He has money for you. He has resources for you. He has help for you. The Bible promises you that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. God has healing for you. God has strength for your weakness. He has so much more, but when you seek to live for today, I mean, even bring it down a little bit more, just living to make a name for yourself. That, that's what the world, that, that is all the world's into. Get ahead, make a name for yourself. Make sure no one ever forgets you. No one ever forgets you. You'll be immortal. No, you won't. It's a lie. And so you spend your whole life with self-effort, burning out and tired, never really surrendering to God. Instead of building God's kingdom, you're building your own little kingdom. And you might do a really good job. It may be the best little man's kingdom, the best little women's kingdom, better than your neighbor, better than what's on TikTok, better than what's on Instagram. You, man, it's a really nice little kingdom but it's not eternal. It wasn't a life invested. You know, when you think about it, you and I have two addresses. Two, we, we live in two places at the same time. We, we have a physical address. We have a body. We have a home. We have a life. We have a name. But we also have a heavenly address. We have been adopted into the family of God. We have a kingdom that God is building that's beyond it's not built with man it's God building it and on the one hand we're seated with Jesus in the heavenlies and at the same time we're dealing with things so it's what we're praying about the the battle between the spirit and the flesh we live it every day this is exactly the thing the flesh build for yourself protect yourself don't die to yourself protect yourself make sure that everything you get everything you possibly can out of every single situation and yet the struggle comes is when we forget we're heavenly citizens and that this world, you know, Jesus said it best. I want you to see it. Hold your place in Genesis. Would you go over to Matthew chapter six? This is the battle with the Tower of Babel. This is it. This is Jesus would clear it all. Notice with me in Matthew six, pick up when you get there in verse 19. I mean, this is it. And this applies to money. It applies to time. It applies to talents, all of it. It, it's, it is the key, is one of the keys that God has for our lives. Notice he says in verse 19 of Matthew 6, he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures. And what does your Bible say? On earth. Because this is what happens. Moth, rust, destroy, thieves break in and steal. Temporary. Fragile. They don't last. They wear out. If somebody doesn't steal it, it wears out. And if it doesn't wear out, it gets all beat up and scratched. And if it doesn't get all beat up and scratched, a brand new one comes out three months later. And through clever marketing techniques, you think you need that one too. Let me just tell you, this has been a battle in my life when it comes to the iPhone. 
So let me just say, <laughs> this, is, this is truth, straight truth. This was the first year I really felt like God said, don't get the new model. And I didn't. I'm still using the one-year-old model. Now, that may not be a big deal to you, but this is an area of my life. I don't, I don't really get into too many things, but very good, best of the best electronics is one of the things that, that I enjoy. And it's a tool. I use it. It's a tool. It would be like getting the brand new hammer or brand new whatever you get. Whatever your tool is, it's a tool. And I use it to its fullest extent. But I felt like the Lord was speaking to me about, and I, and I can upgrade and I've got ways, I've got a contract and everything. It won't cost me hardly anything. So it's not even a price thing. And those of you that know me know that I can be extremely frugal and get very good deals. That's not even the issue. I know how to save. I, I, that, that's not the issue. The issue is the heart. And I think I would have been able to get one without sinning. I think I would have been able to get one being a good steward. All of the marks that you would look at in your life as unto the Lord, except I had a hesitancy in my heart about it. And I felt like it was from the Lord. And what would it be like? I have to say, I even bought a case ahead of time for the new model. It's in my desk, sitting there unused. I was already prepping and getting ready. I got the new cover for it, a new case for it, and it's sitting there as the investment for me to learn how to obey God because it's sitting there empty because I felt like a burden. Nobody told me this. This wasn't some marital argument. It wasn't anything like that. It was the Lord speaking to me about, Ed, this is just an area of your life. I, it's almost like he was testing me. So this is an area of your life. Are you, can you live with the one-year-old model? Yes, Lord, I can live with it because I don't want to get bound to things. Nevertheless, I can be bound to things, but I don't want it more than I am. I don't want to lay up for myself treasures on earth. He says in verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He says, because their moth rust doesn't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. And the key is, is that you learn that where your treasure is, your heart follows. Your heart, speaking of the seed of your emotions, speaking about your desires, speaking about your passions, speaking about your commitments. You wonder why you're drawn in certain areas. It's because that's where you've deposited your treasures. And you have a natural propensity to protect your treasures from rust, from moths, and from thieves. So that takes a lot of energy and effort to keep up with all that stuff. And as you deposit things in heaven, you just trust the Lord to protect them. And think about your deposits, some of the things you treasure the most. Your kids, you got to commit them to the Lord. That's where God's going to protect them. That's where they won't be ripped off. God will never rip your kids off. He will strengthen them and protect them and guard them. The world, that's all in, they're all into ripping kids off, confusing kids, grooming kids, taking advantage of kids. And as parents and grandparents, we need to walk eyes wide open to make sure our kids, their hearts are deposited in the Lord. We were, once again, talking about children's ministry as we're moving in a new direction, uh, new leadership, and just really just encouraged by the love and compassion and care that this couple has to take care of the time that we have with your kids, to deposit the word of God into them, to make it creative, to make it engaging, to, to build trust in them, to remind them that their identity is in Christ and that Jesus loves them. It's a, it's a tall order, but God is able to, he's gonna make it happen through us, your kids. But you know, we can't do that more than you. Did you know that? We can't do that more than you. I, I can't parent your kids more than you. I, I can't accomplish in 90 minutes what you could accomplish in two hours or 20 minutes or a lifestyle of living for the Lord, you're the ones. And this battle, this struggle affects more than you think. I mean, if that's all you're into, you're going to get to the end of your career 30, 40 years later, and you go, okay, now what? Things have changed. I remember my father. My father was, was a, a very simple man, educated into mid-high school, I think, and became a printer. That's what he did. He worked on setting up the type upside down and backwards so they could print newspaper pages. That was his career. And he did very well at it. And I remember as a kid thinking, uh, as I, got a, I bought my first computer as a kid, my parents bought it for me, 
And, and eventually I got this program where you could type on the screen and it would print on a printer. And I wasn't the sharpest knife on the block, but I do remember humbly going to my dad and saying, dad, you need to learn this because I think this is the way they're going to do it in the future. I, I don't know how, what that meant. I, if I would have, we would we probably wouldn't have met because I would have bought stock in AOL and Apple a long time ago when it was penny. So I, it's not like I knew, but I did get a sense. I could see a little bit. It's always been how the Lord's used me. I can see a little bit, but man, not the big picture until it comes. But I remember talking to him. I remember my dad going, no, no, son, that's not, that's not going to happen. We, they will always have newspapers. Well, my dad's in heaven now. He's like, oh, no, no, that's not true. They're not, no, things change. And of course it did change because the computer replaced my dad's job. And I wonder, my dad wasn't the kind of man that invested his whole life on. He just, he learned a trade and he figured that would be the rest of his life. That's all it was. But even in simply learning a trade, he had come to find out that that trade was easily replaced. And all the time they learn and all the experience they learn and everything, they, one day the, after he went from company to company that kept using that equipment until finally they replaced it, his last company said, I'm sorry, there's... There's no need for you anymore. We are doing it with computers. And I wonder how many times we come to a realization very similarly where we spend our time, hey, we're going to build this for us. We're going to build this for us. And you might finish building it and stand back and go, look at this tower that we have built. Look what we have done. And then only come to find out that it was laid up on earth and it was ripped off and ruined. You see, wherever God has for you in this world, whatever career path he has you on, whatever trade he has you, listen, it is solely for the purposes of glorifying God. That is the value of your trade. It's not your paycheck. It's not your title. As important as those are, those are important. You can use them. But your trade is to connect you with people for the glory of God so that you can invest. God has put you in different places so you can connect with other people and be used mightily by him. So come back to chapter 11 now. It doesn't take long as the same language, culturally connected. It doesn't take long for man to come together, to be together. And then there's even choices with being together, isn't there? There's even choices where you can gather together and let's do something for ourselves or what God has created in Christ You know, because it's natural to crave and desire companionship and friendship. There's nothing wrong with that. God has made us people to connect with each other, some more than others. Some some are just so friendly and hospitable, and you just have so many friends. Why? Because God made you that way. We've been made for fellowship and connection, not isolation. And so what has God done? Jesus has provided for us the church, fellowship, koinonia, sharing life in common being brought together, not to build towers for ourselves, but to to collectively come together for the glory of God so that we might love God and love one another and share our lives and friendship together. And so we set aside times in smaller groups, activities, trying to cultivate an environment for personal growth with others, just like the early church. They continued steadfastly, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer, and then what do they do that? House to house group to group. And here they are. They come together and immediately in verse 3, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And then notice, I have these underlined in verse 4, come, let us build ourselves a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let's protect ourselves. Let's protect ourselves. And let's pause for a moment on this topic of bricks. Because you Bible students understand that when God instructed the nation of Israel, when they were to build an altar, remember they were to build it out of stone. They were built it without any instruments. It was to be something that was used in worshiping him. Build it out of stone. But here in building something for themselves, they built it with bricks. Now, practicality, 
There is a practicality. They were cheap, available, convenient. But there was also a spiritual message here. In Deuteronomy, the children of Israel, you're going to build something to worship, an altar of worship. You build it out of stone. And so the things that were used to worship God, the altar, the temple, build out of stone. But that which was used to glorify man was built out of bricks. Now, bricks are a symbol, a symbol of man's hard work, a symbol of oppression, as you remember the children of Israel in slavery in Egypt, as you'll see coming forward in the scriptures, will be building bricks out of straw on behalf of others. The house of God that's still to come will be made out of stone. And even as God has built a new temple, remember the the new temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, you and me, how does he describe us? As living bricks, right? No, we're described as what? Living stones built upon one another. The work of God compared with the work of man. Think about bricks for a second. Bricks are man-made, they're brittle, and they easily fall apart. Bricks are made exactly, almost, the same, basically looking like the next. And here, the Tower of Babel is a city being built of rebellion against God. Uniformity, not unity. The work of man's efforts. Obviously, there's no indication here in their language of them asking God. You know, you come to chapter 12, God is speaking to Abram. Here in chapter 11, nobody's speaking to God. They're just telling God. They are just displaying it. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do it for ourselves. This city, they don't want God's help, so they make it with their own strength and their own power. And there's a usurping of God here, using men to be servants, to build a tower to Nimrod's own glorification that he might ascend to heaven and look God in the eyes and be equal with him. Does that sound like anyone? Does that sound like the devil to you? And the descriptions of the devil throughout the scriptures? Jot it down, you don't need to turn there, but in Isaiah chapter 14, you can compare Isaiah 14 with here in Genesis 11. I'll read it to you in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you were cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. This is exactly what happened in Genesis 11. They're being weakened under the leadership of one man. He's collectively and collaboratively taking all of their energy and effort and he's using it to build a tower for himself. He's saying it for for everyone else, but it's really for himself. And listen to the words of Lucifer. He says in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. And this warped view of unity comes from the devil himself. He unites under false pretenses in order to take advantage and destroy. Now, what's so wrong with building a tower? nothing in and of itself, or a city. But as you look at verse 4, you see it's all about them. Let us, let us, let us, ourselves. They were developing a political unity in the city and a religious unity with the tower, without God in their thoughts at all. And, and this is something we have to look in the mirror from time to time and just make sure like, that this doesn't take control of our thoughts. But the motto then is the motto now. We, you just go, let's just make a name for ourselves. Let's just do something that outlasts us and make a name for ourselves. Today you have people just talk, after I die, I want people to remember me. And so buildings and streets and benches and museums all bear the names of people in their memory. But how did they get their money? How did their money come? At the backs of other people. Maybe an investment here or there. How how did they get that? Really not from the backs of other people or investments at all. It was the provision of God in their lives. And the provision of God in their lives turned out to be just a name on a building. 
that with a simple earthquake or some disaster or some thief or moth or rust, whatever it might be, it'll go away. Babylon, that's Tower of Babel, the beginning of the Babylonian city, it's all for man. Now, I know we're building this up. There's a lot to this chapter. We'll see how far we go, but I, you've got to grasp these things as we launch into the rest of the Bible and kind of tie, as chapter 12 now, we're going to be starting to look at people. We're finishing up chapter 11. You've got to tie in what we've learned already. I want to take you back to the Garden of Eden. I want you to think for a moment back to the Garden. To Adam and Eve, every tree was available except the one that provided the knowledge of good and evil. God had prevented them from eating. He said, everything but. Now, have you ever wondered why the tree was called that? One reason for sure is that if Adam were to eat it, he would be declaring openly that now he was consciously and knowingly rebelling against God. That first bite was a conscious public declaration of Adam's independence from God. That is the consequence of sin, independence from God. It's interesting, we live in a culture that values independence, but God, he doesn't value independence like you do. He values interdependence. He's always reminding us, stop thinking of only yourself. Think of others also. Think of others I mean, why do we need to constantly be reminded of that? Because this is in us, the the sinful nature we carry around. The battle of the flesh and the spirit is make a name for yourself. When when that that fruit of that tree was eaten, they now began to sin against knowledge. They received knowledge. And when they continued to sin, it was now against knowledge. But let me suggest even a deeper reason in light of Genesis 11. Adam and Eve, when they ate that fruit, they experienced the consequences that God said. They died spiritually. Eventually, they would die physically, but they immediately died spiritually. Satan told Eve, you'll recall, that if they ate it, their eyes would be open and they would know good and evil. In a twisted and perverse way, The devil was right. There would be a new existence for them, a new set of knowledge. God said it would be better to live with me and not knowledge. But they were fake. They were fooled and tempted to live with knowledge and not God. And what was the first thing they noticed? Their nakedness. They didn't know they were naked before. And the first piece of knowledge, at least that's recorded for us, is that they were naked. And God says, who told you you were naked? (laughs) Like, what's going on here? Again, revelation questions, not for God, but for them. And how did you get that knowledge? Before man ate from the tree, he didn't know about evil. He just knew about God. That was his existence. It's not that Adam was dumb. He was a highly intelligent man. So he wasn't dumb when I say that. God had just protected him for a whole subset of knowledge that he knew would ruin his life. And he protected him. As long as he agreed and obeyed, he lived in that protection. You know, what was Adam's life? You know what Adam's life was? It was very simple. He knew God and walked with him in the cool of the garden. He enjoyed God. He enjoyed life. He didn't deal with any kind of consequences of sin. He didn't deal with anything in his head. He didn't deal with the flesh. He didn't deal with sickness, disease. He didn't deal with anything that you and I currently live with. He just knew God. I mean, if you think about it, some of the deepest desires and longings of your heart is exactly what Adam had in the garden. You just want to know God and enjoy him. I mean, if you don't use the language, I'm sure you think the language. I just, man, I'm tired of this. This is too much. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm not, this is hard. Bad day, stress day, worry day. It's like, I don't want to play games anymore. Drama. Somebody texts me today. He says, oh, I'm dealing with all this drama. Drama? I'll tell you some drama. You want to serve some drama? Don't save it for your mama. I'll tell you right now. I'll give you all kinds of drama. You, and that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with all kinds. Our drama, your drama, everybody's. Adam, before the fall, he just knew God. But it changed. 
after eating and disobeying, all of a sudden, what happened with Adam is they're now receiving information independent of God. And this wrecked them. It wrecked them. They broke fellowship with God and marched away alone, trying to hide and take care of and build their own little kingdom. In their forfeiting of that intimacy, they decided to go do their own thing their own way. They exchanged the love of God for the knowledge of the world, and it got them in big trouble. That's what's happening here in Babylon. This is the heritage of the Garden of Eden. Independence, knowledge, idolatry, pride, selfishness, self-worship. It's all here. It causes them to build a tower and a city that was designed, in particular, this tower was designed to replace the worship of the one true God with the astrological zodiac worship of pagan idolatry. Stargazers and occultists blocking out God of their lives. Nimrod is the founder of this false Babylonian religious system so that the Bible becomes the story of two cities. The very first tale of two cities. From Genesis to Revelation, Babylon, the city of man-made glory, man's effort, and Jerusalem, the city for God's glory. And the point is that they wanted to reach out and take dominion of their destiny from God himself. And God will allow you. If that's the direction you want to go, build your towers and build your cities and build your name and be miserable and frustrated and separate, living on knowledge instead of intimacy. Living on knowledge instead of intimacy. That's why people like to argue all the time. They live in the world of knowledge. Intimacy, intimacy uses knowledge in a proper way to encourage and build one another up closeness. Babylon, well, you know in Revelation chapter 17, Babylon is used as the descriptor. Well, let me read it to you. It says the woman in Revelation 17 was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. This is where it all starts. But even back to the Garden of Eden. And where are we? Where are we when it comes to Babylon and Jerusalem? Where are we exactly? I know the silly illustration of my iPhone doesn't seem like much, but I've learned over the years that if I don't pay attention to the small things in my life, then I'm definitely not going to see the big things. And I'm preparing to teach a Bible study not too long from now to a group of men, and the, the heaviness that's on my heart for them and for us in general is just finishing well. I have friends that not only are not finishing well, but they're not finishing at all. And it grieves my heart. I've been around now pastoring in this city for in many years where I've seen also many people not finish, not finish well, not even want to finish anymore. And it breaks my heart. It's not God's will for you. He doesn't want you to run around naked with fig leaves hiding from him and hiding from his love. It's just because you desire to take a little bite that you shouldn't. Like he desires the intimacy back with you. He's calling you back. Maybe you're listening in. You haven't been walking with the Lord for a long time. Even connected to our church right now, listening on there like, stop your prodigal living and come home. Not because you're a bad person, but because God loves you. And there's no need to live in guilt and shame your whole life. And it seems as if the things that God tells us aren't things that we, he should, but he's going to remind us because we all have short memories. <laughs> I want to finish well. I want to finish even greater than I started, whatever that might mean. I, I want to grow in God's grace and knowledge. I want to take as many people with me, and it's going to require, in deeper ways in my life and in yours, a sensitivity to the smaller things, to the still small voice, to the willingness to be misunderstood by people or to be mocked or laughed at or to 
whatever it might be, just to walk humbly with our God, to be broken. Well, notice verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and, that's what they, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth and ceased building the city. And therefore its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Now some would come here and go, wait a minute, I thought the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. That's true. When you're reading the Bible, you have to be careful with context. You simply can't take two English words, that one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, and say, there, it's the same English word, so here's one and here's the other. You need to understand each in its context. God is not the author of confusion that will confuse you from understanding Him, that will confuse you from worshiping Him, that will confuse you from being in relationship with Him, that will allow the, His gifts and, and the, the, the exercises of His gifts to cause all kinds of confusion where attention will be taken away from Him. But it's certainly God's prerogative to switch up languages so that He will break up this perverse, twisted, sinful unity that is ultimately hurting man. And that he's coming down and switching things up for them so that they might now, as Paul would say, that mankind is groping now, groping for meaning. They, they are, they, as he's saying, and I think it was in Acts chapter 17, we'll get there eventually, uh, that God has allowed this. Let's go over and let me, because uh, that's on my mind, I want to read it to you. Go to Acts chapter 17. Paul is on Mars Hill and he is teaching them and he's talking about the unknown God and he says in verse 24 of Acts 17, he says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's not worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation so that they might seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of our own prophets have, or poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. This is what's happening in Genesis 11. God is coming in and switching up the languages so that they might grope for him. And then another note, verse 7, as we're running out of time, there's that phrase, let us again, this inter-Trinitarian dialogue. And there are many today would say, oh, there is no, no such teaching as the Trinity, Trinity, and yet it's all throughout the Scriptures. And in the progressive revelation of God, we see the fullness described for us in the New Testament and the New Covenant. But even here, remember back in Genesis chapter 1? Uh, Let us. So we have the hints of the triune God even here. Also, remember, God is, when we're reading the Bible, we're reading it from a, an anthropomorphic perspective. And that's just a fancy word that we're trying to describe God in human terms. I mean, we still don't fully understand God. There's so much mystery. God is God and we aren't. So we use the language that we have to describe God. That's all that's happening here. We're trying to describe what God is doing from our point of view, even though they had imagined that God was done with them. He's seen it all. Nothing happens apart from God. So what does he do? He scatters changes their language, scatters them. And his answer to their folly was swift with lasting judgment. By the way, if you like to write in your Bibles, you can circle the word babble. It means confusion. 
The city of unity was actually a city or a tower of confusion. Notice in verse 10, we have the genealogy of Shem. A little bit deeper, the focus on Shem beginning with his son Arphaxad. And we kind of read through. And then in verse 27, it's the genealogy of Terah. As he begot Abram, Nahor, Haran, and Haran begot Lot. And we'll be getting more into the life of Abram as we go through. It says in verse 31 that Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son's Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years. Terah died in Haran. So just a little bit of review before we leave. We got just a few minutes. Remember, in the beginning of our study in Genesis, I broke down the book into two halves, four events and four people. So four events from chapters 1 through 11 was creation, the fall, the flood, and now we just finished the nations. In the second half of the book, which is the majority of Genesis, verses 12 through 50, we have four people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And now Abraham will take our attention for the next 13 chapters. Even as I was looking ahead, putting together the study for chapter 12, I decided to not just plow through it, but we're going to do it in two studies because I really think there are things to draw out from the call of Abram. Uh, Because almost any big step of faith, almost any church planner, almost any missionary takes back their step of faith that God used um, chapter 12 in their lives. Get up and go. Well, where am I going? I'll show you when you get there. Take a big step of faith. Follow me. And, and many of us, when we look at that, I know God used chapter 12 in my life to begin the ball rolling of, you know what? I'm going to take you somewhere else. You're going to be doing something else. And just beginning to think. And Abram will take our attention for the next 13 chapters. He grows up in Ur of the Chaldees, which was another idolatrous city filled with idolatrous people, a place of pleasure and wealth, knowledge, schooling, intellectually advanced, worshiping many gods. Terah, Abram's dad, was a rank idol idol worshiper. Nahor and Abram, they take wives. Sarai's mentioned here. Uh, We're going to get to it as we get into the studies. But I think today, just thinking about this tower, that we have a choice to invest our lives in that which is eternal, or to invest our lives in that which is not. And Jesus was serious to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth. So Father, we pray as we come to the close today and, and just some, some deep, deep things. You know, are we going to build with bricks or with stones? Are we going to find, God, our satisfaction in you? Or are we going to find our satisfaction in others or other things. And it's just a battle. It's such a great time of prayer for us, this battle of the spirit and the flesh. It's so true. And even in our best days, God, we still get it wrong. And even in our best decisions, we still have things skewed. And even in our best you know, days of, of worship and adoration, and we can end the day with going, what a day, it's still... so much less than what you have for us. And Father, we pray for your spirit just to hang heavy upon us as we consider the Tower of Babel. We consider what we're making with our own hands. We consider what you're doing in our lives. God, help us to follow you closely that we might trust you in the deep times and the barren times and the challenging times. I was thinking of that verse today too, God. You said, you brought us thus far. Yes, you have. And we give you the glory for bringing us thus far. May you receive the glory from our lives that you have saved, you have redeemed, and you continue to use for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, don't stand yet. If anybody here right now among us, you guys online and on the radio will acknowledge you too, but... If this, this, this theme of building with bricks or stone really ministered to you, laying up in heaven or on earth, just like really ministered to you, and you want 
a little bit of a, a extra prayer, like just to affirm that God spoke to you tonight, would you stand to your feet? Just you. And it may be just one, it may be all of you, I don't know, but like this theme of the battle between eternity and now, building with my hands, building with what God has given me. If that's you, would you just stand? We want to pray for you. Uh, if you're just like, that's me. And we're not even in Genesis 12 yet. That'll be next. So just stand. Let it be a, stand, a time of humility, and then we're going to come around and rally around to pray for you. All right? So anyone else before? Because everybody's going to get up, and it'll be chaotic. So we want to make sure just that theme, to now or later, now or eternity, anyone, bricks and stone, bricks and stone, bricks and stone. Some of you, the word for God for you is you go down to Home Depot and buy a brick, and you buy a stone, and that becomes something you place prominently, so God will remind you of this. Every time you see it, brick or stone, brick or stone, it's your choice. Work of my hands, the work of God, what is it? Anyone else? <clears throat> okay, so everyone else, look around. Don't get up yet, but just look around. Pick somebody. So look around and pick somebody in your head. So look around, make sure nobody's missed. Don't want anyone that's standing, you guys that are sitting, look for someone. So go ahead and get up and go to them now, and we're going to pray for them. Okay, so pick the person and go to that person you picked and let's pray for them. And if you okay, well, it's too late now. They're just going to lay hands on you, so it's going to be fine. And this is something that you miss when we're not gathering together. It's something you miss when they try to separate you from worshiping. It's something you miss when you're fearful of COVID. It's something you miss. You need the personal touch. Is there anyone on the stage? Okay, so anyone else on the stage? Okay, so I'm going to need some people up on the stage with me because my hands are not large enough. Uh, so a couple of people. Come on, Stephen, are you, come on up for your dad. Um, anyone else I can spare? Come up on the stage with Henry. How about on this side? Somebody come on up. Yeah, come on up. I'm going to pray, of course, because I have the microphone on and we're on the radio, but I'm not the only one that needs to pray. If you have a word, supernatural word of knowledge, a supernatural word of wisdom. You have something you came to church with to pray. Go ahead and pray it over them as I'm praying and just pray it out loud. Um, if multiple people are praying at the same time, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You just give. God brought you to pray, some to be prayed over and some to pray. So go ahead and do that in obedience right now. And Father, we are grateful for the humility in this room, Lord, as we think of the brick and the stone. God, we think of the, the challenge of the work of my hands and my mind and my knowledge and my expertise. And then that simple trust of what you have already created. And we're not going to take all the things and put them together and create something, but you have already created. And so we just pray for the wisdom and the knowledge that comes from you. We don't want that broken relationship. It's been restored in Christ. We don't have to run away and cover our nakedness or cover our, our weakness, that we can come back to intimacy and strength and power. And I pray that over my sister tonight, Lord, as she comes standing right here on the stage saying, me, God has spoken to me, and may your words come alive. May they be powerful. May this be a rhema word that speaks to the soul of men and women, both here and out, that, God, we are not merely desiring a Bible study, but we want to be studied by your spirit and changed from the inside out. And God, as you hear the prayers of your saints tonight, may they be heard and answered according to your will. And may great victory and may great overcoming, may a spirit of overcoming descend upon us and just great strength on the things that have been beating us down and worrying us and stressing us out, that you would have the victory in our lives by our surrender. And collectively, the church says together, amen and amen. We have got a victory for his goodness and his graciousness and his power and his love for you. It just so struck me to think what broken, what, the, what Adam and Eve really lost was God. And here we are as Christians in and out of church. And I wonder if what we've really lost is ours all along. And God is pursuing you and saying, where are you? 
where are you? He doesn't have to come down and go, hey, you know what? Let's make, let's, let's stir things up so they don't do this in rebellion anymore. You can have the voice of God in the garden say, where are you? Where are you? Come back. And let the Lord do that work. Let's stand together. People will be up here to pray with you, encourage you. Maybe you just met somebody, man. Maybe you want to ask the person that you prayed for, are you okay? Check in on them. Get a name, an email address if you're comfortable with that. And let it be the beginning. It's not a church service. Come in, do my thing. I mean, some of you are like, man, I've never done that before. It's the first of many times. And you know what? You can pray for anyone at any time. You don't need a pastor to tell you that. You don't need. You can ask a question. Hey, did this, you can walk out to the parking lot. And say, did the Bible study just affect you? Yeah, it did. Well, can I pray for you? Well, my brother, he's in surgery. He goes, yeah, man, I'm, I'm sober by the power of God. Well, you know, that, that stopped the conversation really quick, but it didn't stop the seed of the gospel to be deposited in a precious nurse who has the gift of mercy or has a merciful heart, really. Like God has you to be the church. So let's be the church, church. Living stones built upon one another. And those of you that were prayed for, by faith, you received the prayer, by faith. That's it, just walk out going, I received that, Lord, I received that. I couldn't believe what she was saying. That's what I was thinking this morning. Why? Because God already knew. It's not on my notes. At the end, make sure you tell everyone to pray for each other. It's not in my notes. God loves you. He wants you to connect with each other and be not building some tower into heaven, but taking people into the heavenlies through the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless you guys. Have a great week. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.